Well, there we go. Welcome to Scripture Buddies, where we study um, conference talks and scriptures, and we follow President Emily Bell Freeman's Inklings uh, uh, program. And this semester, it's called um, Evidences of His Love. This is April 2024 conference. This is our workbook that we work in. And we're studying section 109. And then today we're studying the talk, Swallowed Up in the Joy of Christ by Elder Brian K. Taylor. And then the subtitle is, I testify that our Heavenly Father hears your tearful pleadings and will always respond in perfect wisdom, which I just loved, loved this talk. And then our sweet uh, sister in Christ, Kathy, just texted me that she couldn't join us today because her sister-in-law or her daughter-in-law just texted her that her son was um, having a heart attack. And so I wanted to show you guys too. I said, do you want me to put their name in the temple prayer rolls? And she said, yes. And she sent me his name. And you can put the your friends' names and family names on the temple prayer rolls on your app. And you don't have to go to the temple, right? And so you can just put it on there and, and then the name will be on there for two weeks. So that's a little tip for everyone, right? Because who couldn't use some extra prayer rolls, right? Temple prayers. Anyway, so we send her love and peace and health for him, right? You just have to remember when when they have uh, breaks. Like we have a two week break coming up in a in a week. So all they do is they send it to the next closest temple. You don't have to remember that. They there take you care of the app does it for you. I do this all the time for people. A lot of people know to send me their names or can you put my name on the prayer rolls? Um, the app is the the God, what's this app called? Tools, Gospel Tools app. That's a great question, Lori. Thank you for asking that. It's the Gospel Tools app. And let me see if I can get my phone close enough to see. Can you see where it says Gospel Tools? That's what it looks like. Anyway, it uh, it has your directory, temples, calendar. I keep my temple recommends on here. I think we're the only temple that does that right now in the world. Our temple recommends on here, right? So... We don't do paper tech temple recommends at the Newport Beach Temple anymore. Well, they do both. There's two temples, maybe three. Yeah, we we test pilot stuff for the rest of the world. Anyway, I wanted to get onto this talk and um and then it's Doctor and Covenants 109 verses 44 through 48. And I listened to this talk um several times and i love in the beginning well why don't you guys start who does someone want to start and share what they just loved about it i have like if you see mine it's all marked like i loved all of this and i loved all of the next page and almost all of the next page so um i i love that in the beginning he gave the three examples of how yearn for miracles because i have a saying called miracles are my normal and everything's always working out for me. And I tell myself that every day when I first wake up. And then right before I go to bed, I like to tell myself that one more time. But miracles are my normal and everything's always working out for me. Even when it's not working out for you, that's still it working out for you. Because we don't see God's timing, right? And we don't know what, what is supposed to be happening in our lives. Anyway, so anyone want to go first? And then I'll share later. Look at all my cute friends. I'll go if you want. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I I loved it because um, this talk um, asks the quintessential question, which is why does God intervene sometimes and not others? You know, it always is difficult for me to think that, um, well, God is helping me find my car keys, but why didn't he stop the Holocaust? You know what I'm saying? Um. And so that's, a, that's a, you know, it's a tough one. It's like, why intervene this time and not that time? And um, and I, we don't have an answer for that. We really, really don't. We just have to trust them. It's it's that kind of thing. Um, and I really appreciated where it said towards the end of the talk, it was talking about engulfing, um, engulfing the pain and the love of Christ and the joy of Christ, um, because we feel engulfed by the pain. Um, <clears throat> so the love of Christ is is bigger than that um and to me this is practice in trusting him this is practice in um and staying with him no matter what because that's what he gives to us he gave a hundred percent 
And um, that's what he's trying to train in us. And it, and he can't train that in us unless he allows us to, to have to, to have to try. Um, although I just do want to make one point that um, I have heard people over the pulpit say that they pray for trials. And I've always taught my seminary teacher, uh, my seminary students, plus my own kids, don't. Do not pray for trials. They will come. You don't have to pray for them. <laughs> um, and and it was it was important to one of my kids that um, that uh, to learn that God doesn't design pain for you, um, because he was kind of under the impression from that kind of talk that well God is making me suffer this way. It's his decision to make me suffer this way. And really, he's not. He's not designing pain for us. He's allowing us to suffer the pains that come and he turns things into joy um and so do you know um the buddhist's uh, little symbol is the lotus flower and i i've always felt that should be the christian symbol <laughs> um because you know the lotus flower grows out of mud and uh and that's what christ's specialty is is to um to turn mud into flowers um so that's what i wanted to share Thanks, Bev. I love that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is in our adversity. Um, I'm I'm reading two books right now. One is um, Oprah Winfrey, and I think his name is Arthur Miller, but I'm not sure. Anyway, he he's a Harvard professor, and he teaches a class on happiness. And she fell in love. She would read his articles, right? And then finally, she reached out to him because she just loved what he was talking about. But he says, you have to have adversity in your life to have happiness, that it is part of happiness and being happier is uh, it's navigating uh, adversity. And um, you can't be happy every second. And that's an unrealistic expectation. But if you don't have adversity in your life, he has pillars. You know, I'm still in the beginning of the book, but um, that it is a necessary part of, of happiness and being happier is um having opportunities to grow well, and he says that's essential not that interesting can i say something yes go aunt Talleen. hi good morning everyone i'm just so happy to be with all of you it's so fun to see you beverly anyway um we could have just read jacob four is it or, no second nephi two we have to have opposition in all things because if we didn't, we wouldn't, we'd just be in the middle all the time and never know. We, we can have joy according to our pain. If you don't have pain, you won't know what joy is to, to get out of it. And uh, so we, it's a necessary lesson we have. That's why we are given a body to be able to feel things we cannot feel in the spirit. We have to have opposition. And so the Lord allows us to feel these things because it's our schooling. Our, it's our schooling here. We're to learn how it feels to manage pain and joy. And I love this thing I just read. I don't remember exactly where I heard it, but it says waiting to learn things on the other side is like trying to learn to play the violin without a violin. We have to have this body to feel pain and joy. And so Heavenly Father allows us to go through these things because we're in school. And we have these lessons to learn that we cannot learn any other way. So that was it. I love that. And that I love the part where they said that no pain is wasted. Not one thing is wasted when we suffer. We're not wasting our time. And I, I think that's right there in, in seven. Yeah. Paragraph seven. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let but going right along with that, if you look at paragraph 28, what Sister Linda Reeves says is, mm -hmm. she testifies, I do not know why we have the many trials that we have, but it is my personal feeling that the reward is so great, so joyful, 
and beyond our understanding that in the day of reward, we may feel to say to our merciful loving father, was that all that was required? Yeah, interesting, different perspective, right? Looking back versus looking forward or being in the middle of it. And it was in paragraph 10 where it says, Elder Orson F. Whitney taught no pain that we suffer, no trial we experience is wasted. It ministers to our education. All that we patiently endure builds up our characters, purifies our hearts, expands our souls, and makes us more tender and charitable. It is through sorrow and suffering, toil and tribulation, that we gain the education that we come here to acquire, and which will make us more like our heavenly parents. Yeah. And isn't that the goal? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Lori, did you have something you wanted to share? Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, Hi, I gorgeous. I like in uh, 21, just the bullet item of divine principles. And I like how he laid it out with uh, three divine principles. And the first one being um, stronger faith comes by putting Jesus Christ first. Look unto me in every thought. He declares doubt not, fear not. Um, the second one is uh, brighter hope comes by envisioning our eternal destiny. Um, that was just uh, explained. And um, the third one is greater power comes by focusing on joy. And I think it was Bev that was talking about being swallowed up um, and how Christ took that bitter cup, um, that his will was being swallowed up in the will of the Father. And it talks about in Spanish, that's translated to consumed. And in German, it's devoured. And in Chinese, it's engulfed. And um, at the end of 32, it says that we should suffer no manner of afflictions, save it be swallowed up, consumed, devoured, and engulfed in the joy of Christ. And um, uh, it, it's tough going through challenges. I don't like it. I don't know. I can't imagine wanting to pray for more of them. Like, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> uh, but I, I really... Um, I look back because, you know, I'm much older now than I was before. And in my first, uh, how I learned the gospel and how I thought I was supposed to live the gospel, looking back now, I can see um, the errors of my own understanding. And I think like when Christ talks about that time in Gethsemane <clears throat> and how hard that was for him, that's in writing, that's in scripture, that is for the whole world to read right? And, um, but there was one thing that, I don't know if I could even find it while I'm thinking about it, but um, the author of this talk talked about how we hide our sorrows in our hearts, and we go forward and still serve other people and, and appear to be joyful and all that, but we hide our sorrows. I think that is, um, in my understanding today, is kind of a misnomer because we're, I don't believe we're supposed to hide the pain and sorrows in our hearts from other people. I think that's kind of toxic. Um, it lands in our bodies. Um, it's kind of suffering alone. And yes, we can commune with our Heavenly Father. Um, but we do need other people. And of course, doing nice things for each other is great. But I think that's a cultural thing, a cultural thing in the church where we pretend and hide that we don't really have these sufferings. Um, but I think Christ as being the great example is his suffering is for everyone to read. And even Joseph Smith in the Liberty Jail, um, the suffering that he went through, it's in um, Doctrine and Covenants. I think they talk about that in paragraph 30. And I think those are two great examples of, of burden and suffering and and heavy hearts. And I don't think we should be hiding our heavy hearts. And so that was my uh, thought in the past that I just, you know, suck it up and just keep moving forward. Um, but I think we need to share our burdens, not just with our Heavenly Father, um, but with each other and not pretend that 
like the Facebook life, you know, we have this Facebook social media life, everything's wonderful and great. Anyway, it was just a small little, um, <clears throat> small little jewel for me to be reminded to see Christ suffering, Joseph Smith suffering, and to be that little um, <clears throat> note of how we hide it in our hearts. I think I misunderstood that in the past and it caused me greater suffering than what I should have had when I could have had support of my community. So that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Lori, that's so beautiful. And I love in paragraph 33, it totally, there's a part that goes with that. It says, for when you bring the Savior's relief to others, you will find it for yourselves, taught President Camille N. Johnson. And um, I think that um, someone once told me, you know a lot of people whose kids are on drugs and alcohol. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, you know the same people. They just confide in me because they know I won't be judgmental. And uh, that because I'm open about what happens in our lives and I share about um, our journey, because I feel like when I spread my love and light and I, 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 I share everything real on Facebook, right? And um, pretty much my whole life, like the good and the bad. And I think that um, that's one of the things that they said, women's happiness has gone down since the invention of social media because people only post the highlights of their lives. And so then they compare it to these other people who are not posting their real life. And um, I think that the best person, like when Carter came home from his mission with cancer and we were at the hospital, uh, one of our first visitors that first week were two ladies in our ward whose both kids had had cancer and they know how to sucker, right? And um, they came and um, they came together and both their kids at some point had had cancer in their lives. And I feel like these shared experiences, even though it's not exactly the same, right? Like, I don't know what every person who's had a kid have cancer is going through. I don't know what every person who's had a kid live in jail is going through, right? Or had a kid on drugs or alcohol addiction. I don't know exactly, but I do have a certain level of empathy and understanding for the pain and suffering of that person because I've actually been through that. And um, even just holding space for the person, not, not giving them advice or anything, just holding space for that person where they just feel safe, I think helps uh, create uh, suckering for and relief to others, you know, just knowing that somebody else has survived, right? Like Colleen Lowe has survived a lot of stuff and been through a lot of stuff. And, um, you know, someone told me, oh, you're so friendly and kind and nice and non judgmental. And I said, well, I've been through hell. And slowly and over time, and I have a long way to go still, but I feel like all those, like that, what, where Joseph Smith said, where it said, you know, all those things will give you experience, right? And um, we can choose to be bitter or better, right? And um, in the word better, it has the letter E, right? They're both, they're the same words, bitter and better, but you have the we, the bitter has an E in it. I mean, bitter has an I in it, which for I, you know, like about focusing on I and better has an E in it and it's about we and sharing, right? And I don't know, I just had that epiphany the other day anyway. Um, who else wants to talk? Where's our, who wants to go next? Catherine or Irene, do you want to talk? No. Okay, I'm going to go. Oh, Irene does want to talk. Oh, good, good, good. Sorry. <laughs> took me a while to get everything unmuted and stuff. Um, I, I love that he, um, he talked about this family who had lost their, their 12 year old son. Sorry, I got emotional about that kind of thing, having experienced it, but that that she was the mother was able to find peace and um 
and through her faith in Jesus Christ, recognized that it is, even though her hands her hands and feet were severely burned from trying to rescue her son. She said that it, it is the hands of Christ that are the saving hands. And um, that's such, it's, it's just such a beautiful concept that we can have peace in spite of, you know, whatever, that was a horrendous, experience and they came away with peace that's just so beautiful to me it almost doesn't seem possible but i know it is because i've i've had it so that's what i noticed about it and that in the end for his conclusion um that's what he i don't remember now if i can uh, pull that up. Uh, that's what he also concluded with. Oh, no, I can't even find it. Anyway, I love that he brought it back to uh, the promises of the Savior um, that we can have peace through him when we bring our burdens to him no matter what we have to go through in this life it's for our good it's for our benefit and i agree with i don't remember which one of you <laughs> you said we don't need to pray for <laughs> adversity <laughs> but that is not a good idea um uh, we will have uh, the adversity that and that we need to learn it will come in our life and and we don't need to ask for it. But I do remember um, my patriarchal blessing refers to things that, that I might have a rough time. And I remember when I was uh, around 20, I thought, yeah, well, I've been doing pretty well with <laughs> the hard times in my life. Oh my gosh, I was so stinking clueless. <laughs> So uh, we do not need to ask for it. We we will have the um, the adversity that we need to learn and to grow. And um, and I know that we are never alone. That Jesus Christ is with us, and Heavenly Father hears our prayers. And they are answered. They are always answered. That's something that um, took me a long time to figure out. That I, I would think that huh, sometimes he answers and sometimes he doesn't. Well, no, he always answers. It just isn't always the answer that we want. <laughs> we ignore the answer or think that it wasn't answered if it isn't the answer that we want. The answer might be no. This is not for your best, or it might be you need to wait a little while. I have something better in mind for you. Uh, but our our prayers are always heard and are always answered. Um, and he said in this talk, um, the words of Christ, where I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders that everyone that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage, that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And I know that he does. Um, he is He's with us and, and he can help us to feel peace in the most amazing situations where it doesn't seem like it would be possible. So those are my thoughts. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I agree. We don't ever need to pray for adversity. I've had plenty without any asking for any of it. <laughs> yes. I used to think, oh my gosh, how much more can one person handle? Let's let's heap on some more. And then when you're in the middle of the, uh, the most difficult po possible situation of your life, one time, like when Carter came home from his mission, then something else happened in the middle of that that was even like more like mind blowing, like difficulty. And it's like, 
ready to just crawl in under my bed like our dog does when the fireworks are going off. <laughs> our under the bed. I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to live out mortality under my bed. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I think I can get out today. I think I, I can't do this. But I love in paragraph 38, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And um, that is from John 14, 18, right? And um, I do testify that he does come and the, and the answers always do come and they might not align with our perception of what we would like. And that's why I love in the beginning is where Bartimaeus got an answer immediately. And then at the, the man at the, Bethesda, he it had to happen twice and then the apostle paul it was never granted and i think that it's trusting in god and trusting in his timing is really and submitting our will to his will is um is the part of the becoming as as we become more christ-like and um then and we shed off the natural man over time and i do think that age is a beautiful thing if, if that we we gain more wisdom over time and um that um it really does help and i love this other promise here in um on uh paragraph 16 he, he says uh president nelson shared this valuable insight as we look at all things with eternal perspective it will significantly lighten our load. And um, I, I know I've seen it any time that I've ever felt like I can't do it one more day, like that I'm just like maxed out, like like I'm just done. Like I can't do one more day because the, 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 it's so heavy, the burden. I, I remember coming home any day I felt like that, and there would be something awesome, like a text message, a card in the mail, someone would send a fruit uh, bouquet or flowers, or someone of, would there be a treat left on my porch, or somebody flew my Alexis and Alex out multiple times, and I'd show up at a restaurant, and there'd be my daughter, and I'd have no idea that she was there, and I just think, Heavenly Father never leaves us comfortless, right? Like he always, there's always scaffolding that is put around us. And um, the really cool thing is, is that we get to be the scaffolding for other people, right? We can be Heavenly Father's hands here on this earth. If we just develop that relationship with him and ask, start asking more often, who can I check on and what can I do for them? And um I bore my testimony about this in Sunday at um, in fast and testimony meeting in our ward. Um, I usually just ask Heavenly Father that question in the morning, you know, what can I do and who can I check on? And I had done that, but the evening came and I had this feeling I should go to the temple and, and I had some free time and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. And so I had John print out some names and then it came to me for initiatories because I love to do initiatories because they're quick and you can get them done and then I can be gone. But it came to me, you should print out some baptism names. And I'm like, wow, I don't know how I'll get those done, but okay. So I said, are you sure you want me to take baptism names? And um, it's so funny as I had just gotten out of the shower done from swimming. And so I just cleaned my hair, which I'm just got, I'm now over the whole hair thing. And we won't go into that between the, how many times I'm doing initiatories and swimming and showering. And anyway, so I went and took the baptisms names, the bap, you know, those names, with me, including the initiatory names. And when I got there, I, the most beautiful girl in my ward was working at the, um, at the recommend desk and I at first even asked her what are you doing here because I thought it was Saturday for some reason it was Friday and I'm so glad she told me it was Friday it was her day because I knew she worked on Friday because I was getting ready to fast for fast and testimony um but I was getting ready on Friday instead of Saturday because I had my days mixed up this is what happens when you get older right <laughs> and so um I mean I literally was already started my fast even though it was the wrong day right <laughs> and um, it's so funny, right? It's so funny. And she goes, oh, no, it's Friday. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad you let me know I can eat tomorrow, right, tonight. 
still. And anyway, so they sent somebody, they sent a worker to the baptistry to see if somebody, they, they had a ward that was local there from Newport Beach, Irvine area, that um, if they, if they were baptizers would be willing to baptize me, right? And they came back and said, yes. And I thought, oh, bless their hearts. And so I went and changed and I had eight names. And um, this one girl from the ward said she only had one name and she'd be happy to do four of mine. And then I did four. And then there was nobody there on Friday night. And so I got to be a witness for them to help them, right? And then this sweet kid baptized me, right? And then the sweet people uh, gave me confirmation of the Holy Ghost, right? And then I went with, and then I thought, oh, wait, I don't know if I have a brush or, you know, makeup. I didn't think about, like, all the ramifications of the, um, the getting baptized, right? Anyway, so I went to do initiatories with soaking wet hair, and I put it in a ponytail and, uh, with uh, not brushing it. And, um, <laughs> and... <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that, right? Anyway, and then I ran into someone I, I was glad to see. And then I did two sets of initiatory. Nobody really showed up for their appointments that Friday night. So I got to do 10 initiatories. But then I went to go print more at the office, and they wouldn't print. And they weren't supposed to print because even this young guy said, oh, I'm the family history specialist for my state, and I, I know how to do it. And he tried to do it. He goes, I've never seen that before. And then the still small voice said, the temple names that they're going to give you have been waiting forever. And they it would be really nice if you could go do temple names instead of your family names. I said, okay, great. So I went back and did them. And some one of the names was from 1300. Another one was from 1500. And um, I just felt so close to those sisters too, as the names got done. And then I closed down the temple, you know, it was nine o'clock and time to go home. But um, I just feel like, as we listen, and I, I feel like I go to the temple a lot more because I understand at my age that the power, I feel like it's a booster shot going there. I get a booster shot, uh, like a vitamin booster. You know, like when people go get an IV booster, I feel like when I go to the temple, I'm infused with the power of Jesus Christ. And it gives me a more celestial perspective on my life and to help me um not succumb to the the enticings of Satan, you know, he tries to trick us and and I just feel like it puts a bigger buffer between me and him. And so I just want to testify to you that as we listen and um fine tune that we can uplift other people, right? I ran into people there and I even though it might be people on the other side of the veil, right? All those people moved a, a further along their path, right? That don't have the body. It's like Aunt Aline said, if you don't have a body, you're at the mercy of one of us to do that proxy temple work for you, you know? Anyway, Catherine, do you have anything you want to say? I don't know if you want to share or not, or if you're in a position to share. I'm sorry. I can, I can barely hear it this morning. I don't know why. So I'm just listening. Oh, you can barely hear? Well, we're glad you're listening and that you're with us. We love you. I wonder why you can barely hear. Can everyone else hear it okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wonder. That's interesting. And then I don't know. If, I don't think my cousin Lori can share. I think she's driving or something. And then Callie. I thought Callie joined us for a few minutes. Um, John, do you want to share? We'll ask John Lowe if he wants to share any insights. No, I don't have anything to share today, babe. It was a good, great talk. But, uh, and I did review it before. Oh. You guys have covered most of the <laughs> stuff in there. You know what we forgot to cover is DNC 109, 44 through 48. Well, you better do that then. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting in 44, it says, um, It, it says, but thy word must be fulfilled. Help thy servants to say, with thy grace assisting them, Amen. thy will be done, O Lord, and not ours. And I do think that's one of the hardest things, right, is to submit our will. And then I love, in verse 46, it says, O Lord, deliver the people from their, the people from their calamity of, their wick, of the wicked, 
and enable thy servants to seal up thy law, which is, a, you know, the sealing, um, the sealing power, right? Being sealed. But I love this. And bind up the testimony that they may be prepared against the day burning. And I love being bound to Christ, right? And, um, and then it says here um, in 47 that, uh, that this yoke of affliction may be put upon them. And thou knowest, O Lord, in verse 48, that they have been greatly oppressed and afflicted by wicked men, and our hearts flow out with sorrow because of their grievous burdens. He's talking about the sweet, the sweet pioneers, right? They're being persecuted and suffering, terrible. And um, and that didn't end. They had to eventually leave, right? And even last week in our Come Follow Me, where uh, Am. Alma and Amulek witnessed all the women and children being thrown into the fire, into the furnace, the believers, and they sent the men away and women and, and the women and children were burned, which women and children were considered, you know, nothing. And they, they burned them. And Amulek said, hey, why don't we save them? You have the power of miracles. And he said, God restrains me so that and so he, he couldn't do it. And um, that 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 they would be that those wicked people would that their voices would call against them for the wickedness that they had done, and we don't know why sometimes think people are you know saved from their you know like why does some people live and come back from a sickness and then why do other people die, and um, we don't know we don't know that for sure you know and. I think yeah. that is like what, what Beverly said. That's one of the great questions, right, of life. And and I think okay. that with our mortal eyes, it's hard. And that's why I think the prophets asked us as our world becomes more turbulent and to for us to have a celestial vision, right, and to try to become more celestial, right? Well, the um, one thing. Go ahead. Thing you do know. Colleen, oh, dear. Yeah, the one thing we do know, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I the one thing we're absolutely sure of and that our, our faith has to be solid on is that we know Heavenly Father loves us and that whatever is, whatever happens, something, it, it, he will allow only the things that are good for us. And so if we have a rock solid testimony of that, that he loves us and whatever it is, it must be for, for our good somehow, some way. Yeah, he That's loves us I so mean. much. It, it says here in paragraph 40, I witness that our savior lives and his promises are sure, especially for you who are troubled or who are afflicted in any manner. I testify that our Heavenly Father hears your tearful pleadings and will always respond in a perfect wisdom. May God grant unto you, as he has done for our family in times of great need, that your burdens may be light, even swallowed up in the joy of Christ. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. And, and, and we have to trust in that, right? And that's where our faith comes in and our faith grows, right? I feel like faith is a muscle, right? And the more we exercise it and grow it, it, it can expand, right? And um, I don't think we would be the people we are today. I know I would not be the person I am today without all the opportunities I've had to grow because there's no way I would be molded into this person without those opportunities and experiences because it's impossible. It's like almost trying to say like, oh, let me explain the Grand Canyon to you, right? But really you can't do, I, my words can't do justice to it. Even a picture, if you show someone a picture of it, it, I mean, it's vast and big, right? But when you actually stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon and you see that this little river dry, over time cut down and made this vast expanse and it's so deep, right? That, um, I think that it's like that. You unless you see it and experience it, we, that's why Jesus Christ had to come down to earth, and and that's why in the Garden of Gethsemane he bled from every pore because he experienced all the things that we experience, all our all our joy, all our pain, all our suffering. You know, 
It has to do with the privilege of having a body mm -hmm. that comes with a body. Tell us more about that, Allie. <laughs> having a body, <laughs> well, it's our great gift. It's our great gift from having faith in the Savior before in the pre-mortal world that we were granted this gift of a body and we we're given it to to learn from it's our instrument to learn how to be like our heavenly father who has a body so it's it's we're to take care of it and uh, help people know how to handle it and and pain and joy and how can we resist things you know we have to get this body so it can it's not in the driver's seat it's a test between our spirit and our body, our flesh. And we're always in this competition of who's in the driver's seat, the spirit or the body. And our goal and Heavenly Father's goal for us is to have our spirit in the driver's seat of this body. Yeah, and that's interesting that Satan will never have a body. So he uses addiction and um, to try and... He, try, he uses the body to attack people, right? And to try and bring them down. Um, morality and uh, addiction and things like that to, uh, that to to get people off the covenant path, right? And, to, and, and the mist of darkness, right? To pull them out. And he uses the body and to make them a slave uh, to the body because people don't realize. Even I, I've cut out sugar, and I did 30 days without sugar last month. And I asked Heavenly Father, why is it so hard for me? It's like my drug of choice. I asked Heavenly Father, why, why is sugar so hard for me to cut out, right? And he said, I look at it as a treat when I should look at it like poison. And um, that really, really made me think. He said, if somebody offered you cocaine or al a drink of alcohol or a cigarette, or even gluten, because my body's allergic to gluten, and, and I go into anaphylactic shock if I eat gluten. He said, you would never even contemplate or vacillate, or you would just automatically know that that was poisonous for your body and not good for your body. And you would just say, no, I don't, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't eat gluten, whatever it is, you would just say no, there would be no debate in your head about whether or not at, at this point in my life, like, no, that's an absolute hard no, right? And he, but when sugar comes around, I'm, I, I'm like, oh, it's just a treat. I'm just going to have this treat and, and I'm just going to eat this one thing. And this is a, this is just a personal thing that I'm, I'm, I'm on. Cause I notice that I'm, I use sugar to self-soothe myself like an alcoholic does. Right. And, um, to process my life. And, and that is a great coping mechanism up until this point in my life. It's really helped me a lot actually. Right. Uh, I used to eat a thing of Ben and Jerry's ice cream on the way home. I would stop every night at uh, Ralph's and pick up Ben and Jerry's ice cream on my way home from the hospital when Carter had cancer and Mason uh, was struggling. And I would always say I wasn't going to do it every day, but every day I, I did, you know, and I eat half <laughs> one. Every day I'm like, okay, this is the last one. <laughs> This is the last time I'm going to get a banana and a pint of uh, super fudge chunk, chocolate chunk or whatever it was, right, on my way home, right? But then every day I'm like, oh my gosh, this was an awful day, right? And I'm like, okay, I, I deserve this chocolate and ice cream. And so I'll be good tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll start over tomorrow. Yeah, Irene knows, right? This is exactly, and it's interesting. And I've had this struggle for a long time and I just told Heavenly Father, especially going into my 60s here, I really want to be in my, to be the best instrument and hands and feet for him on this earth. I need to be in better health, right? So I can be a better servant and be able to do things that he was going to ask me to do. And I don't know what they'll be, but if I'm in, in bad health, that's not going to, I'm not going to be as effective, right? And I asked him, what can I do to uh, be in better health? And he said, cut out sugar. Like, ooh, that's tough. Anyway, so I cut out sugar for 30 days last month. Then I took a week off and then I started, I'm on day four again. But it's interesting, I felt so much better without the sugar. Not a little better, but like 
like a lot better. And my whole face cleared up and, and um, I just felt, I'm telling you, I felt so much better because the sugar tastes good when I eat it, but then I feel like crap after. And, um, and, and who's in the driver's seat? Yeah, right, the sugar, right? The sugar's in the driver's seat. And I think that we have to look at our addictions um, cause that's an addiction, right? Like I use sugar to process my life emotionally. Right. And it's a crutch for me. And, um, and it, it, I read an article that said that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Right. And so that's very interesting. And I know you can find an article to go with anything. But I do know, and I'm not saying I'm going to give up sugar forever, but maybe I am. Like if somebody offered me gluten, I would never eat it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like never, never, never. Like, because I know I would die, right? Like I might be able to make it to the hospital with my EpiPen, but I might not, right? And, um, and so I just know that as we trust in Heavenly Father more and, and we use our bodies and we submit our, you know, the spirit, and get our spirit, whatever our addiction is, right? It could be watching too much TV. It could be, um, it could be anything. Games on our phones or whatever it is, right? I, I don't know what. Away, yeah, anything that takes away agency, anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's good. Anything that takes away agency. And so for me, I, I'm doing another um, 30 days, right? And um, it's just interesting. But when I first found out I was allergic to gluten, I would cheat and eat gluten sometimes once in a while. But now today it's life threatening. I, I never would do it because I guess it's been so long, right? That without the gluten, it's almost been uh, 16 years now. And so um, I just want to testify to you that as you examine your own lives and see what is what is what is the thing that maybe you need to let go of to become more Christ-like and be a better servant of Heavenly Father, that Heavenly Father will give you that witness and that revelation for you in your life. Because we only have control over ourselves and that's hard enough, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm being real here, do you know what I'm saying? Like cutting out sugars, um, I still think, I mean, in the beginning, the first week's the hardest, you know? Like I think, oh my gosh, an ice cream before, you know, bowl of ice cream before I go to bed sounds so yummy. And, um, and I'm not saying that sugar's bad for everyone. I'm just saying for me personally, do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, it but is. I just, huh? It is bad for everyone. Yeah, it is. It's not good for us, right? And I think in the culture of our church, if you go to activities, um, mostly it's all sugar crap, which I don't understand. And when they bless it to nourish and strengthen us, sometimes like in a baptism, like it's going to need a lot more of a blessing than that to nourish us. You should have brought some fruit and vegetables. Like, like we already know that that's not going to nourish our body, right? Like it, it's really bad for you. Like, like when Carter had cancer, they said, you know, sugar feeds cancer, according to what, the, you know, the doctor said. And I'm not a doctor by any chance. You know, I, I'm, I barely graduated from high school. My mom can attest to that. So I don't know much, but I do know that um, that as we as we take inventory on our lives of whatever it is, if it, if it's something that's sucking our time or something that is sucking our you know our food, processed food or whatever whatever it is, I just know that our body is a temple, and that we will be more effective servants in the latter days in this day that we live in. It, as we take inventory on the things that maybe are no longer serving us well. And so one of the things I did was I said, well, for the habit of eating ice cream all the time and, and junk, I just said, thank you for serving me well. That was a great coping mechanism. It was much better than doing heroin or, you know, going out <laughs> and, you know, beating people up or whatever, right? But the bottom line is, is that 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 habit's no longer serving me well, right? But I, I thank myself. And so I don't want guilt and shame or anyone to, because I don't believe there's anything good that comes from guilt and shame. And so I just feel like, just, just thank myself and my, in that life for that, in that moment in time and up until now that I, I use that as a coping mechanism. And then today I'm, I'm looking at journaling as a better coping, better coping mechanism. And then also, um, like I wanted a treat yesterday, so I had watermelon and, um, I'm counting that as my treat, right? Or I had um, an apple the other day with apple butter on it. And so I'm trying to replace 
uh, the ice cream and chocolate bars with something healthier. So I just know that, I don't know what it is for you, but I just know that I was supposed to share that with someone. I don't really know why. So anyway, does anyone else have anything before we wrap it up and talk about what's next week? Well, <clears throat> as I looked at the yearned for miracles, it came to me that we have had <clears throat> very similar situations uh, in our family. Grandma Astley had breast cancer and she was given a blessing that said she would be healed. And if she would uh, do her calling, which was primary president in her ward, and she did it when she just could hardly drag herself out of bed. And it she didn't get healed. So she went to the hospital. They were going to do a mastectomy on her. And <clears throat> the morning of the mastectomy, they had done x-rays the night before. And they just said somebody decided to do another set of x-rays. And the doctor couldn't believe it because the ones from the day before showed the cancer, but the ones from that morning showed no cancer and she went home cancer free. And I've always been rather glad because if she had somehow died from that cancer, I wouldn't be here and neither would you. Uh, but your sister got cancer and we all prayed for a miracle and it didn't come. She died. But uh, we've, lived through that and we know that the Lord loves us and loves all of us and that somehow it will all be for our good and we have come to learn to trust the Lord even in difficult circumstances exactly yeah that's the key and I know Irene's buried a few kids and a husband so she knows I have, a little, bit about I have, the difficulty. I have a little poem I memorized. Can I tell it to you? Yeah, we <laughs> want to hear it. It's, it's the, it, it just goes, it's, it's in the songbook. It's one of the verses of the song. In word and deed, he doth require our will to his, like son to sire, be made to bend, and I, a son, learn conduct from the Holy One. Mm, that's beautiful. That's what we're supposed to do. Be in a position to listen, hear, and obey. That's our practice. Yes. And I do think like you have that that part of that song memorized. Um, one of the one of my coping mechanisms for um all when I feel stressed out is that I can play two songs on the piano that out of the hymn book by heart. And one of them is count your many blessings, name them one by one which I think is 241. And then number 136, I think is, I know my redeemer lives. I know every word to those two hymns by heart. I have played those songs so many times when I felt alone and like I couldn't go on or that it was just unbearable. And I think that when you have a go-to scripture or a go-to hymn, um, I think it really does help us to self-soothe and to bring the spirit closer to us and to remember um, that we are loved and that we can obey and, and, and keep moving forward, right? Because sometimes it's just putting your foot in front of the other and keep living another day and keep going. And some days are harder than others. And then some days it's not so hard, right? But I do think when we have our, I have my go-to favorite scriptures on here. I have a list on my phone. And that way also, because I can't remember where stuff is as, as easily as I wish. And so when I feel prompted to send someone an uplifting scripture, I don't have to think, oh, I wish I knew one. I have a list of my favorite scriptures, right? And um, I can just copy and paste and send someone a scripture. And so I want to testify to you that I know that Jesus is the Christ and that he loves each of us. And I think that the most incredible thing is, is he knows us. He doesn't just know your name. He knows your inner thoughts. He knows the desires of your heart. He knows the yearnings. He knows that you're yearned for miracles. He knows the things of your heart. And that I, as we trust in him more, we will find more joy in our life. 
and that um that yeah as we submit and listen and overcome our bodies right and not let our bodies rule us and um whatever that looks like for us and i just know that we will have more joy and that jesus can be our best friend he's my best friend and i know that um everybody can have that kind of relationship with them if they choose it. We each get to decide how tightly we're bound to him and that um, how will we give up the things? Will we ask him, what else do I need to give up? How can I become more like thee, right? And what habits do I have that are no longer serving me well? And, um, and have the courage to move forward and to trust that he can make us into better people than we can on our own with our own perspective. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah, this was a good one. I loved it. Next week is God's intent is to bring you home by Elder Patrick Kieran. Oh my gosh, this was one of my favorite talks. I say that every week, but <laughs> you um, just say that every week. <laughs> I do. This was my favorite talk. I say that every week. Oh my gosh. And it, and the subtitle is everything about the father's plan for his beloved children is designed to bring everyone home. And I love his accent, right? Do you, do you hear it? Doesn't he have an accent? Mm -hmm. And then, and then for doctrine and covenants, let me look it up in the front here. And I don't know what the affirmation, she didn't post it in sister bell, Emily bell Freeman's her, her husband started chemo yesterday. So I'm sure they're having a lot go on. Having had a kid that had chemo. It, it's it's the, not... the next four verses from DNC 109, like 46. I think it was 41 to 45 this week. It's 46. No, to... no it's 49 to 52. This oh, okay, week. I'm off a week. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. We love you. And we thank John for setting this up because literally, you know what? You guys listen to the still small voice our relief society president she's so awesome i'm just in love with her and she sent out just an email hey i'm going to go on a walk from my house down to the pier you know because we live by the ocean and if anyone wants to join and she had a little sign up thing and i didn't know if i'd be able to do it and i hurt my foot yesterday anyway I, my foot felt a little better so i said yes and I, I could make it back in time for this and two of my best friends from our ward showed up too. So it was just our Relief Society president, Jennifer Benedict and Kelly Jones, who I just, I love these women so much. And anyway, we walked, but I couldn't walk the whole way. So I had parked my car where I knew I could get back in time. But she noticed that there was a little circle in the ocean when we were on the pier. And she said, guys, look at the, look at where that little, that little ripple is, right, in the ocean. And so um, the... Um, we watched and two dolphins came out and we watched them. And then we told other people that were on the pier to say, Hey, come watch the dolphins. And so this other lady said, Oh my gosh, thank you so much for pointing out the dolphins to me. And, um, I'm just glad that I went out because dolphins bring me joy. Like on my worst day of my life, like the worst day of my life, I went paddle boarding, but I wasn't really up to paddle boarding. And it just came to me, it was in the middle of the day and on a weekday, uh, um, it was, and I laid on my paddleboard and the spirit said, and you know, there's boats and stuff. So you got to kind of paint it, but there's nothing, there's no noise. No one's on the water. Right. And I was laying there and this still small voice said, sit up. And I sat up and this dolphin came right up to me, like over my, you know, put its nose or whatever it's called right over by my, 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 I, at where my hip was right because now I'm sitting up and he just stared at me so intently and this can sound crazy but I just thought okay Heavenly Father it's and I just felt like that dolphin was telling me I'm aware of you it's gonna be okay you're gonna be fine and I'm aware of what's going on and I then he literally just stared at me and then he just went away that dolphin right and I was just like because I'd been laying there and I didn't realize how far I floated I had literally floated all the way from where I launched, all the way to where the boats, at the end of the, the houses, and I was already like in the circle bay, you know what I'm saying, the big open space where the boats go out. And I sat up and then this dolphin just came right up to me. And I just thought, oh my gosh. And so whenever I see dolphins, I just think, oh, they're just so cute. Cause Heavenly Father said, I do feel like, and maybe I'm totally hallucinating, but I feel like Heavenly Father sent that dolphin to just like, tell me, you're gonna make it Colleen, it's gonna be okay. 
because that day I was like, oh, yeah, I'm done. I told Heavenly Father, you can take me home. I'm available. Like, I'm available to go home anytime. He's like, yeah, you're not coming home anytime soon. So anyway, but I was like, yeah, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> anyway, and I made it. I'm here. So anyway, anyway, so if you can, if you can squeeze in the little things, like I didn't get to do my hair before I jumped on here, but I just threw on a dress and but I got to go on a walk with my Release Society president and two sisters that I've just known forever that are dear to me. So when Carter had cancer, she's really Carter's other mom, Sister Benedict. And I was getting like hundreds of text messages and it was complicated. And she always, she did all the emails. She sent out the email updates every, every week and let everyone know what's going on. So there's good people out there, you know, that are here to help us in our times of trial. And we, and we can be that for someone else. So anyway, you guys are awesome. Join us next week. Share this video with other people. And invite your friends that you think will benefit, right? And I'm going to turn this off now. I just wanted to share um, that my friend sent me this BYU address. It's a BYU speech. It's called Let Us Run With Patience, The Race That Is Set Before Us by Bradley P. Owens from 2024, June 11th. So June 11th, BYU speeches on Apple Podcasts. Let us run the, with patience the race that is set before us. It was really good, Bradley P. Owens. So I would highly recommend it. I've listened to it three times since I got um, found out about it on Sunday. And I just have taken tons of notes. I loved it.